good morning. <laughs> well, it's a good thing I waited as long as I did. I okay, go ahead. Thanks. So, uh, before warning, is that coffee is not present? Yeah, just actually, I was just about to say. So, so we're going to get a little bit into this, and we're going to take a little break so people can go get some more coffee. So, um, I don't want to be falling asleep in class this morning. So. Um, all right, so we have been working our way obviously through the Ten Commandments, and we've gotten all the way through halfway through the First Commandment. So we are a real a real roll here. Um, last week we were taking a look at, and we kind of discussed this idea of when, when when the scriptures talk about the idea that you should have no other gods before God, that that doesn't necessarily mean that those gods are they're false gods because they aren't gods, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't spirits of some sort, that there might not be actual power behind that, and that one of the real dangers of idolatry in the past, and to a different extent in the, in the present, is the possibility of opening yourself up to demonic or, or evil spiritual influences <coughs> that would not otherwise be able to necessarily gain a foothold. And we, we talked a little bit about um, some of those, some of the aspects of that, and then also more broadly, um, the, the the, the question of whether um, evil spirits continue to have power today and some of those kinds of things. And ultimately, the answer to that was exactly what you'd expect with a lawyer running the class, which is, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not willing to make any firm and definite statements to which I have to sign my name. So, um, But I do believe um, that there are definitely some... It, we don't see it as much in this country. Uh, we are a, a westernized, you know, kind of a, um, a science based or science focused nation as with most of the western nations and because of that you don't tend to see a lot of the, uh, the kind of the really weird spiritual stuff but when you go to places like Haiti, um, Cuba, uh, places where voodoo in particular is practiced, um, I, I have talked to people who have seen some very strange things, very inexplicable things and so I don't know you know, I, I, I'm hesitant to, to try to define the outer limits of the spiritual power of either Satan and his forces and certainly of God and his forces. And so I think we just want to be mindful of, um, as, as several have said, the danger of opening ourselves up to that kind of stuff. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. And as long as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, there's no room for evil, spirit in us, for evil spirits in us. But that doesn't mean that the rest of the world doesn't, um, number one, suffer under the control of Satan in a general sense, but perhaps even in a more specific sense. So, Okay, with that in mind then, when, when, when God says to the Israelites that he wants them to stay away from the gods of the Canaanite peoples, in this passage here in, in Exodus 23, where he says, I want you to completely destroy the people, and I want you to not serve or worship their gods, not do according to their deeds, so don't emulate them in terms of how they worship, but rather overthrow them and break their sacred pillars into pieces. So he wants them to get rid of the peoples that live there, and he wants them to get rid of the idolatry and the idolatrous practices of the people. And notice that he says, do not do according to their deeds. That suggests that he's also saying, I don't want you to worship me the way that they worship their gods. I don't want you to go and, and take some of the stuff from what they do and try to transplant that into the worship of me. Because I'm telling you how I want you to worship me, and you need to do it that way. And he talks about also going and overthrowing the, the, uh, the, the, the places of worship, breaking their sacred pillars in pieces. One of the big concerns that we see coming out later on in the scriptures in the Old Testament is that the Israelites would worship on the high places. And initially, at least, it seems like that might have been focused on Jehovah God. But... What goes wrong when you do something like that? When you don't go to the temple to worship the way that he calls on them to do it? Well, you open yourself up to putting whatever other interpretations driven by man's nature and man's will and man's desire are allowed into that practice. Okay. So it, it, it gives you a lot more risk of adding your ideas into it. And in theory, at least, the priests are supposed to, in part, exist to make sure that the practices of the worship are done correctly. So if you go someplace where there aren't any priests around, you don't necessarily have the guidance of what you're supposed to do or need to do. And in fact, most of the worship activities required the priests to do them anyway. So 
you've got you're, you're inviting a lot of trouble when you go and do something that is not, or you go somewhere that you're not supposed to go in order to actually do the worship. And so the concern is just is that what they're going to do is not necessarily jump straight from the worship of Jehovah God into the worship of these Canaanite idols, but rather that they are going to transition over time from one thing to another, which is a very common thing that we see in so many ways with things that start out good and eventually go bad. So. Okay. Saul even got into trouble because he didn't wait for Samuel to come and do that. That's right. He was determined. He was he was concerned that the army was going to run away, or, or disperse. So he went ahead and offered sacrifices that he wasn't supposed to offer. He was not qualified to do it. It's an interesting thing that Samuel, who was not actually a priest, was qualified to do it because he had been called by God specifically for that purpose. But nevertheless, that stepping outside of the rules is the concern. You. You don't do it your own way, you know. You don't, especially when you have such a detail-oriented system as the old law. You don't just go do things your own way, and that was the big concern. There was that it would tr transition eventually to idolatry, and that's really exactly what happened. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think we see it today the same thing that some people are teachers, but preachers they're not called by God, and they go way off the deep end. That's true. Um, there's, <laughs> there's there's so many examples of that. We, we would we just have to switch on the television on a Sunday morning to see some interesting examples of that. So it is a very problematic uh, scenario. So okay. You brought up the high places, which were a perpetual thorn in the side of the Israelites throughout their history. Yeah. And while I think I agree with you that they started with that Levitical influence and in, involvement. Can you remember who ever talks about the Levites who lived in the land leading any of that? The only, the only <coughs> specific example I can remember of a Levite getting involved with pagan worship was the one in Judges where it's not talking about the high places, it's where Micah sets up a shrine right. and he does that. So I'm not really sure. I don't know of any specific examples of it. It does seem to be very pervasive. Because not only were the priests the ones responsible for sacrifice, it was their job, and they failed this one as well, to teach the people about the law and about the requirements, about what God wanted and how to worship God. And they blew it. Yeah. There, there is a, a um, ideologically, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that for most of Israel's history, certainly prior to David, but even leading up to their captivity in Babylon, that the temple was used only by a very small minority of people um, at all, really. Um, and that, that most of the Israelites were just doing whatever they wanted to. And it wasn't until they came back from Babylon that they were really from Persia at that point, that they finally shaped up and, and as a people, as a whole, really focused on temple worship and what was asked of them. So um, you can start to see God's frustration with that if that's been going on pretty much the whole time. And all you get is a few bright spots here and there. but. That's what the book of Judges certainly seems to suggest. That's what's happening. So, Okay, so he also says to the Israelites um, that I will fix your boundary from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines. That would be the Mediterranean. It's kind of interesting that that one doesn't even have a name, even though it's the biggest sea in the world. But um, And from the wilderness to the river of Euphrates, for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you will drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them or with their gods. They shall not live in your land, because they will make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. And so it appears that part of his argument is, even if you were, even if you wanted to prioritize me ahead of them, eventually you wouldn't do it. Eventually it would be a snare to you, and you would put them ahead of me. And so there's no way that I can let you be like part one way and part the other way. And we know that this is true. Anytime you start serving a god or serving a a force or serving something that is important enough in your life, eventually it will overwhelm everything else. It will become the priority in your life. And so his concern is that there be no influence of foreign gods of idolatry in them so that they will not have any incentive or any any <coughs> pulling them away from him and from him only. Okay. So Joshua, so during a or sorry, during Moses' time um, with the notable exception of what we looked at earlier where the Israelites descended into idolatry and, and all sorts of wickedness at, at Sinai when Moses was long and coming down. 
In, for, throughout Moses' lifetime, he kept the Israelites on the, so to speak, straight and narrow. Joshua took over and did the same thing. And so as he leads the tribes into Canaan, he continues to enforce the um, Mosaic law and the mandates, and the people that are working under him continue to do that, and the people that are with him, the, 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 the Israelites themselves, have seen, either as children they've seen the miracles that happen in the desert, or as adults they are part of the process of taking the land and seeing the victories that God gives them and the different stuff like that. But at the end of his lifetime, Joshua is getting ready to retire, and soon after that he's going to pass away, and so he's concerned to make sure that the Israelites remember the covenants that they've made with God. And essentially when he meets with them at the end of the book of Joshua, he is renewing the covenant with them. And so he says, Therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. So it suggests that at least to some extent, some of them were still going back to the Egyptian gods. Um, or, at least, or at least that was still an influence on their thinking in some way. But he says, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today who you will serve, whether the God which, gods which your father served which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So it's interesting here as well because what he basically is saying is that you've got three choices. You can choose the ones from where you left. Remember what God did to Egypt? You can serve the ones that are the people, the gods of the people here, but look at what we've been doing to the people of this land with God backing us up. Or you can serve the guy who's actually beaten all those other gods and has actually led you into freedom and to, in, into this land of your own. It's up to you what you want to do, but for me, the answer's obvious. So that's basically the, 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 the summary of his argument that he's making here. Okay, let's see. So, everybody says, the response of all the people is, no, we will serve the Lord too. And he goes on, oops, we've lost our, um, okay. We've, <laughs> the remote is coming apart now. Um, it does that when the little rubber band wears out, which it eventually does uh, every time. So, all right, so he says, he says, we will serve the Lord. And the people all say, no, no, we'll serve the Lord too. We, we don't want to do anything else. And then the book of Judges happens and they stop serving the Lord. Um, and basically it says that, that the generation that had been with Joshua served the Lord. The generation after him had largely forgotten about it. And so by the time their generation came around, they started to fall away. And the situation gets increasingly dire as it goes along. Um, and eventually Israel will spend most of its time throughout the rest of its existence in, as, a, as an independent nation in idolatry. Um, the, the Judah, the tribe of Judah, when they split off and form their own kingdom, will have some bright spots of a, a few kings here and there, but the nation of Israel itself, the ten tribes that are left north of Judah, will never really return to serving God consistently at all. Uh, at least not the leadership and not the majority of the people. And so, uh, unfortunately, the system that God has set up, the principles that God has set up, are largely ignored by his people for most of their existence. Yeah. And that's especially sad because Moses told them exactly what to do to prevent that in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6. He said, you guys know all this stuff. Teach it to your kids so they can teach it to their kids. Mm -hmm. It becomes self-perpetuating. Or if you don't, it's self-destructive. And that's what happened. And I, exactly. It appears, and, and we know that Historically speaking, we tend to find that good characteristics, good people of good character, the character that those people have tends to get a little bit less generation after generation. It's not an entirely definitive thing, and sometimes that there are revivals and things like that, but in general, with humans, what happens is that you have a great a generation of greatness. And then the generation after that carries that some of that forward, and the generation after that carries some of that forward, and it gradually gets less. It appears that in this case, it was a, a very rapid descent. Um, it's very difficult to sustain greatness, generation after generation. But in the Israelites' case, it appears that it was almost just a you know great, and then just fell right off the cliff kind of a situation. And you're exactly right. There's a lack of teaching. That the only explanation for how bad it gets so quickly is that the earlier generation simply did not do an adequate job of telling their kids and, and, and impressing on them the significance of, of who God was and what he done for them. 
because yeah, within just that next couple of generations, they're in complete idolatry, and God is having to use the various nations around them to bring them back to some kind of a semblance of obedience to Him from time to time. So this this continues, and really, it's not until. Samuel and then David that you see nationally, number one, the nation actually unite because most of the book of Judges is a series of stories of invasions of parts of Israel, not the entire nation. Um, sections, tribes, different things like that that get invaded and then there is um, a period of time where that, there will be a revival in that area of the land and then eventually a falling away somewhere else. There's some reason to think that even that some of the stories of the Judges overlap each other. There might be a judge up here in the north and another one down in the, in the south and things like that. But it's not until Samuel and David that the kingdoms are truly, Samuel and Saul and David, that the, kingdoms, the, the, the kingdom is united into one nation and the things that are done begin to take on a nationwide scope. And under David, there is a reformation, a restoration, whatever you want to call it, uh, with the people. And that doesn't last real long, but it does last at least through his son, um, and so there's a period of time for about 80 years or so, or the, well, more than that, about 100 years or so, when the Israelites do finally turn back to God and really are doing what he wants, and then it, you know, it all falls apart again. So this, this just keeps happening over and over again. And if you want to go get some coffee, you're welcome to do that right now. So, um, so ultimately what happens is we have idolatry becoming more and more prevalent to the point where finally God starts sending prophets and their primary job for most of them is to call out the idolatry. And the most famous of all of those prophets probably is Elijah. And so in Elijah's case, um, he is called as a prophet and in a time when Ahab the king and Jezebel his queen have entirely replaced the worship of Jehovah God with idols. All the different idols that came from Jezebel's family and from her Canaanite heritage and many other Canaanite idols as well. And instead of having lots of priests and lots of Levites who are leading the people in righteousness, they establish this massive priesthood. Over in 1 Kings chapter 18, um, Ahab, well, Elijah is, is sent to give a message to Ahab to gather all of the prophets of Baal and Asherah on Mount Carmel for basically what will become a showdown between the two of them. And when you add all the numbers up, there's almost a thousand prophets of Baal and Asher that, that show up there. And there's just one guy, Elijah, that's there on the other side of it. And he called, and the people of Israel are called up there, and it says all the people came. Now, let's be realistic. It's not literally all the people, but it's the people probably in the area around Samaria who were called by Ahab. And so Ahab has all of the, the people of Israel. They're up there. The prophets are all there. Elijah comes, and what he says is, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. And again, the thing that we see here is that it appears that while the, all of these idols had become the popular thing to worship, the people of Israel were not completely unaware of God. And most likely they were continuing to worship him as part of a pantheon of God, that he was one of many things that they were worshiping. Because why not? I mean, if you don't believe in God as the only God, what harm is there in worshiping as one of the one worshiping as one of the gods? You're kind of covering your bets. It's kind of like you know, you, you put some money down on you know one team to, to win, but maybe you hedge your bet by putting a little money down on the other team to win or something like that. He's, there's there's this idea that the Israelites have not ever really bought into this whole idea of monotheism, the way that the, the, the that Moses did and the way that the leaders did. The Israelites never really entirely got a hold of this. And it's hard for us to understand this because we live in a very monotheistic culture. I don't mean that everybody in this culture believes in God or worships God, but what I mean is there aren't very many people who believe in a polytheistic culture outside of sort of the fringes of our culture. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, just in, so a lot of Native Americans still believe in the tribal beliefs of the spirits and the uh, nature spirits and stuff like that. There are groups of people who believe in things like Wicca and, and natural spirits and some of those things. But by and large, most Americans will tell you that if they believe in God at all, they believe in the Christian God or a God resembling the Christian God. Or significant minorities of Americans will say that they, they're Jewish and they believe in the Jewish God or in, uh, that they're Islamic and they believe in Allah. In any of those cases, you're talking about a monotheistic approach. 
And very few people who believe, and this is the really key part of it, at this point in this country, people who believe in one of those three gods don't also believe in a bunch of other gods. They don't also worship a bunch of other gods by name or by any sort of activity on their part. So monotheism has become a clearly divided thing. You're either monotheist, theistic, you're atheistic or agnostic, or you do believe in some group of other gods. But you don't see a lot of people who are arguing necessarily that they believe in Jehovah and not in, or, and also all this other stuff. Or you, that would be true until 20, 25 years ago, when more and more this notion of, you know, whatever you want to believe is okay as long as you believe something. And so now you have an increasing number of people who take the position that in fact there, you know, there's, there's lots of different avenues to the truth and you just have to pick whichever avenue is best for you. And when you get right down to it, although those individual people would say, no, I don't believe that in, in anything except you know, God, the simple fact is that when you would open, open, up, open up the idea and say there's lots of different ways to the truth, just pick your own, what you're really saying is that there are other gods. There are other systems. And, and it becomes an idolatrous, or at least a... a um, idolatry is not quite the right word at this point. It becomes a... a, a plural theistic kind of a situation when, you know, we're not just talking about whether being a Baptist or a Methodist is the way it's, you know, if you want to believe in yourself as God, that's okay. If you want to follow Wicca, that's okay. If you want to do this, you know, things that are contradictory, inherently, fundamentally contradictory to the notion of Jehovah God and His Son. And when we start to see that kind of thinking in our society, it represents a turn towards idolatry and a turn towards this polytheism that we really haven't seen in Western and Western Christian uh, democracies and, and, and nations for quite a long period of time. Okay? Just to put it in a plug, it's in no small part why we chose the name we did for this group. The yeah. way. You know, and, and the way. The way. Not a way. No, the way. <laughs> and that's a message that, like you talk about, the world really doesn't want to hear that in the last 25 yep. years. They view that as uh, bigoted and exclusionary and all kinds of bad things. But yeah. Jesus himself said, hey, you want to get to the Father? Go on. Yeah. Through me. And I'll show him to you. You live the way I live. You'll live like I do. You'll live like the Father. So do what I tell you to. Not it sounds mean, but that's true. Well, yeah. it says, you know, and that's you love me, you keep my commands. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that was that would be <laughs> the non-paraphrasing way of saying it. Yes, exactly. And, and that's and so the thing is that mindset comes out of two places. I think. Well, first of all, I think it originates with Satan because it, it is false and it is misleading, and everything that's false ultimately originates with him. But it comes from two two mindsets. One mindset is people who are who do actually have a solid belief in something, but who don't want to run off or offend people who believe something else. And so they either hope that if they are kind of wishy-washy with their answers, those people will be attracted to what they have to say, or at a minimum, they don't want to have to get into the arguments and the defenses of their faith that taking a solid position would require. I think that's one. Then there's the other side of it, and this is the side that's, that's the more well, they're both problematic. This is the other side, and this is the side of people who don't believe, or who believe something that is clearly contrary to the truth, and they are pushing this idea that, no, my beliefs are legitimate too. My beliefs are just as good as yours, or because I don't, I don't believe, but you can't push your religion on me, you can't make that be a norm in our society, even though it has been or was for a very, very long time, you can't do that anymore. That's, that's not, as you said, it's not, it's not, it's not fair, it's not... Um, it's not, um, it's, it's, I forgot the word you used. That it's not politically correct. It's not politically correct, although they don't use that term. Because politics aren't really the, the issue here. The issue here is that, you know, that everybody's ideas are all good. You know, nobody's, nobody's wrong. You know, we don't, since we don't know for sure, nobody's wrong. And that's, of course, deeply flawed. Um, so it is, nobody's right. Nobody's right either. That's the problem. And, that, and, that's, and the, the thing is, you know, some of this derives from science, where there are the unknowns. <laughs> there are things we don't know for sure, and there's theories as a result of that about things, about how, for example, um, the, technically, the, the system that we operate under, where we think about things in terms of atoms 
in terms of subatomic interactions, all this kind of stuff. Now, you and I don't spend all the time thinking about that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm teach, I teach history, not you know science, but 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 underpinning the technologies that we have developed in the last 50 or 60 years is an understanding of the universe that, that derives from atomic ideas, from, um, from uh, subatomic and, 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 and quantum ideas and stuff like that. But none of that is anything that we can actually see. The smallest things that we can see are molecules, and even then it's collections of molecules using a very, very high-powered telescope that is actually operating in a way that isn't really seeing it, it's detecting it, and then it's analyzing what it's detecting. So, even to the extent that we're seeing those things, it's really when you see a picture of something on the on the uh, on the molecular level, what you're really seeing is a graphic representation of an energy spike that this telescope or the, 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 this um, microscope. Did I say telescope? Or? Yeah. yeah, that's what Ken was looking at me like this, and I'm like, I said something that was <laughs> blatantly wrong. So microscope that this microscope has seen, we're not seeing the real thing because it's too small, and so. Our system is built on a theory about how the universe works. Now, so far, most of the things that we think that that theory should predict happening happen, and so it works the way it's supposed to. But it's still a theory because we can't, strictly speaking, see it. And so there's this inherent element of the unknown that's built into the way that we think as Americans, as Westerners, and we get kind of comfortable with that, and we lose sight of the fact that just because we don't know exactly how the universe works doesn't mean that there isn't a definitive way that it does work. And that's also true when we talk about religion. If there is, in fact, a real God, then there is, in fact, a real set of truths that exist about that God, about what he or she or it wants, about what he or she or it expects and will do, and all that sort of thing. And it doesn't matter what you believe or what I believe. The simple fact is that if there is such a thing, then there is a truth. And so if you believe something that's wrong, you believe something that's wrong. And the only way that that works for people is that they have added to this an additional construct, which is that God just loves all of us and wants all of us to come to some sort of spiritual enlightenment, so he doesn't really care how we do that. But there has never been a single system of belief in the entire world that has advocated that particular principle. Every single system of belief, whether you want to talk about the Native Americans and their spirits, whether you want to talk about the Wiccans and their spirits, whether you're going to talk about Islam or Christianity or Judaism or any of these different Canaanite religions that we talk about, none of them have ever taken the position that God just wants you to just be happy and find your own truth. Their position has always been, we have the truth, come learn from us. Or in some cases, we have the truth and we're going to kill you if you won't learn from us. But regardless, we have the truth. Nobody ever says, we have one truth and you're welcome to go find your own. That is a modern day... Um, rubric that has been placed on top of this stuff. And so it is, a, it is a lie to suggest that this is something that has been around for a long time. The worship of false gods has been around for a long time, but the notion that God just wants everybody to you know, find spiritual fulfillment and happiness is very much a product of a modern generation that believes that in fact that's what everybody wants for them, to just find product, you know, happiness and fulfillment and stuff like that. That's just not reality. And so the, the, this issue of having to choose and not saying, you know, all of it could be true, I just happen to pick this one, is something that every religion has had built into it for, I mean, millennia. And this new idea that we can just do whatever we want to is something that's very messed up. But a lot of it, at the heart of it, is what I see in, in some, of the, some of the, they call themselves theologians. I don't think you could be a theologian if you believe that you are God. That's just vanity, I think, at that point. But th their, their base argument is that really God is just in you. And because of that, whatever method you take to get to that realization and to that actualization is just perfectly fine because at the end of the day, you're really just lifting yourself up and um, getting yourself to the place where you recognize the truth that you're really just God, that you are part of the divine and, and that for whatever you do is fine because you're part of the divine. That's the core of all of this. And of course, that is exactly the opposite of the message that we get from God in the scriptures. That we are not the core of all this, that we are not God, and that we are directed by God in specific ways. So when we talk about this idolatry thing, the scary thing is how much and how much more powerful that notion becomes every year, it seems like, and how hard it is to maintain the position of 
No, I believe in a specific, and I do believe in an exclusionary God. Not because he wants to be exclusionary, not because he's mean or arbitrary, but because he knows what the truth is, and the truth excludes the falseness, inherently. Yes, sir? It's astonishing to me to think of this, these people, the Israelites, being so apt to leave a God that manifested himself so many in so many ways that they would choose something else to believe in and that today we don't we're not that way really today at all like you were saying it doesn't even occur to us to go looking for other gods and idols and, and all that sort of thing we're not climbing to the top of the mountains in, in a general sense right. so uh, it's astonishing how that has shifted over the millennium um, but I think one of the main hang-ups that people have is their imagination. If you think about the fact that we're not just curious, but we imagine things that... And if we don't imagine God the way he explains himself, then we just make up a God. Yeah. We imagine something else, and we think, well, that would be better. <clears throat> and so our imaginations are wonderful things. They're very creative but they can lead us down all kinds of strange paths. And one that, I'll uh, just, the, the common vernacular, you know, we've got the, the Bigfoot, the Yeti, the, the abominable snowman, all that stuff. So there are people that are just died in the wool believers in that. <laughs> and if you are one here today, please don't be offended. <laughs> but <laughs> so there is. Christ. <laughs> a walk yeah. A walk yeah. Well, there's never <coughs> been one killed, captured, not a piece, a part, nothing, not a skeleton, nothing. Over the hundreds of years people have believed in this stuff. Mm -hmm. And yet there's still true believers in it because somebody's got a fuzzy, out of focus photograph of one. Yeah. And it just. It's, it, it just shows you that the imagination of mankind can lead you to believe just about anything yeah. you really wish to. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, you mentioned the Long Nights Monster. I don't know if you, if you, anybody has noticed this, but there's this thing Ken has. So just in the last week or so, the Loch Ness Tourism Authority has announced a brand new, like, they're, they're calling in people who want to go searching for the Loch Ness Monster, and they're going to make it this, the largest search ever for the Loch Ness Monster. Right, try to go find this mytholo mythological animal. Now, I find it interesting that the organization that's running this is the, the Loch Ness Tourism Organization. <laughs> and you wonder if perhaps there might be some other goal that they have in mind for this search than, than perhaps actually finding the Loch Ness Monster, such as bringing in as much tourism as possible, which is their job. And so you can't blame them for doing their job exactly, but the simple fact is, as you said, there's never been any, any, any bones, there's never been any any, you know, corpse, there's never been any sort of a, uh, you know, any sort of tangible evidence, and yet people continue to believe this, even though multiple <coughs> science studies of the, of the lock itself have suggested that there's absolutely no way that uh, the, the size of the water that, that it is could support a breeding population of animals that are that large. The science says it's impossible for that to actually be the case, and yet people continue to believe because they want to believe. And really, all of these false gods were people <coughs> use their imagination to create. The sun comes up every day. The sun is really important. It must have something divine or, or you know, God related in it. So, what might be the god in charge of the sun? You know, and and, and just that kind of thinking, that inventiveness, is a strength of humanity that leads us to all sorts of amazing discoveries, and a failing of humanity that leads us to all sorts of stupid <coughs> ideas as well. And that's just the situation. Our imagination is, it is it can be a great, a great benefit, but also a great detriment. Barbara? Well, I was going to say, Steve talks about we're not climbing that on some high mountain or something to, you know, uh, find a God. But people, in, you know, in our culture are finding all kinds of gods. Anything you place before God himself is a God. Yeah. And that can be money, it can be sports, it can be anything that is more important to you than God. Yes. And, you know, that's what our society needs to fight against, is that um, 
whatever we're placing before God because, you know, a lot of people, that's not a priority to them if God is not, you know, yes. to, to worship Him. And you talk about the ones that believe there must be somebody in charge of the sun or the moon or, you know, those things. And there is. And He's <laughs> only one person. And that's the thing people don't realize is we have one God and He's the greatest thing that there is. And they don't, I don't know why that's so hard for people to believe. <laughs> well, yeah. But to me, that makes a lot more sense. Uh, you know, even when I was a kid and they were teaching us uh, evolution in school and that, you know, we came from apes, I'm thinking, that's hard for me to believe. Why are there still apes? If we develop from apes, why are there still apes running around? You know, uh, why didn't they change too? That just didn't make any sense to me. Yeah. And that, you know, never has, uh, you know, I just couldn't believe it. So, but I mean, a lot of people do. Yeah, most people do. So, all right, so, yes. So, so like, today, most uh, say that Christians and mm, the <coughs> The bigger part is the natural question and they think if they go to those party churches, oh that's all that they have to do. And the Israelites did the same thing. They go to the party temples where they have <laughs> the prostitution and everything right in there, a lot of fun and drinking and whatever the heck they did. And today it's the same thing again. You know, then they go for, I want to have fun, I want to be entertained <coughs> at the real churches with the real truth <coughs> are small. And look at those mega churches. They are horrifying. I think we have to be a little bit careful about overgeneralizing <coughs> in that regard. I, I don't think you're wrong that there is certainly an urge to get to, towards entertainment that we see among people uh, in, in, who, who would be Christians. But I also think that one of the, the reasons a lot of people end up staying with those larger churches is because what they find there is a degree of community and active activity and involvement that a lot of smaller churches just don't offer or are not willing to, to, to do. And so when you talk to, for example, people who've left the Church of Christ and joined some Bible church or some community church, <coughs> by and large, when I talk to people like that, they tell me the thing they like the least about the church is the music and the loudness mm -hmm. in the worship. But the reason that they stay is because of the community, because of the events, because of how involved they can get and they can get their kids involved. And so I think we have to be careful because there are definitely two different mindsets and there are two different kinds of, of these mega churches, these really big churches. There are mega churches that exist primarily to service themselves and to bring in money and to provide a form of kind of watered down Christianity to get people, <coughs> make them feel good and get donations and that's pretty much it. But there are also churches that have grown very large <coughs> because they've been very effective in creating a community and creating involvement. And, and while they certainly do have finances because they are large organizations, <coughs> they're not doing quite the same kind of stuff that's quite so entertainment focused and it's much more focused on service and activity and things like that. So, and outreach, absolutely. So to your point, and I realize that we're not in the Bible Belt, but Sarah and I lived in the Bible Belt in Houston for uh, oh, six years or yeah, it was more. Hey, hey, no we <clears throat> we were in what um, out here we might consider a mega church, right? We were um, twelve hundred members strong at second service, right? And there was another six or so at the first service. Not to mention the evening service, which brought in probably five. There's a bunch of members in this church, mm -hmm. is what I'm saying. Um, but just as you said, uh, and, and we were, the small churches were the weird ones in Houston. <laughs> okay, right? <clears throat> you had, um, but our church was a, um, was a, a non-instrumental. Um, strong church. Strong church of Christ. Christ. The, there was uh, the eldership was 
12 or 15 people and the only the, the only way that you became a fly on the wall in that church is if you actively tried so the size of the church I don't think matters I don't think it plays a bit of point or a bit of whatever in in straying from the word because um, they exist is what I'm saying yeah I would agree. The church I attended at Oklahoma, when I was an Oklahoma Christian had, well, at the time it had about 2,000 members. Now it has closer to 3,000, which mm -hmm. is vast. But to the point, they're rare <coughs> things. it's a rare thing. It is a rare it's thing. There aren't very many churches. The big churches usually become big either because they have a, you know, they have the, the there's a production and spectacle to it, or they become big because they are very attractive to people because they're looking for something that smaller churches don't necessarily offer in terms of that larger community, in terms of activities that appeal to specific subgroups sure. and stuff like that. So like I said, I think we should have to be careful about overgeneralizing. For a long time in the Church of Christ, we spent our time looking at those bigger churches and critiquing them for being so entertainment oriented and doing things like that. And we didn't really pay attention to the fact that a lot of them changed. And we used to, you know, they don't baptize, they don't teach this, they don't teach that, they don't really study the Bible, they just go and they want to be entertained. And over time, those churches behind our back, because we weren't paying attention, we were just too busy telling everybody about what those people are messed up like behind us, we're turning into something else. And many of those churches have, you know, a lot of Bible studies, and they have a lot of teaching, and they do teach the need of, uh, for baptism, and they do teach things that we would be, a lot of Christian, of Church of Christ Christians, would be shocked to find out what a lot of those community churches do teach now and do do now. And I think increasingly we've reached a point with some of them at least where we're simply reflexively saying, well, there must be something wrong if they've gotten that big. <laughs> well, there's another alternative explanation for that. It, that is that there might be something wrong with us because we're staying so small, you know. So anyway, I think we just want to be really careful about that and focus on the, the details rather than the assumptions. So. That is so very important, and, and to piggyback off of what Barb said, yesterday Steve and I uh, sat with some people that we have known for years, and they knew where we go to church. We found out yesterday both of them were raised in the church. Mm. He was a PK, he came back from the war, and he just, he had a hard time, and they said, well, you know, and at the time, this was the thing, we're the only ones going to heaven. And he flat out told him, if you're the only ones going to heaven, I don't want to be with you. <laughs> so we have to be careful of how we think and how much we uh, criticize, to your point, <coughs> Ryan. Uh, you know, I, I had no idea. And they still feel like they're good, all is good. So, you know, they're in my prayers now daily that maybe we could have them come back here and worship with us. But... They don't have any interest yeah. at this point, so they have other idols before them. As Barb was saying, anything that you put before God right. is an idol. And we're going to talk about that next week. We've got to stop now, but next week we're going to talk about this issue of other stuff that we put before God. Because the problem in our society, for, as, as we've said, for most Christians at least, is not that they believe in other gods, that they believe in Molech or something like that. And, and, and even to the extent that they, they have the idea of let people pursue their own path, they're still not believing that for themselves. The problem is all the stuff in our society that we put ahead of God that we don't call God because we know that would be wrong, we just treat it like God. So we're going to talk about that next week.